Hey, and welcome to the Resource Center webinar on Working with American Indian and Alaska Native Individuals, Couples, and Families Conference. Today's call is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Ms. Stephanie Vester. Please go ahead, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you and welcome everyone to this National Resource Center webinar on Working with American Indian and Alaska Native Individuals, Couples, and Families. Again, I'm Stephanie Vester. I'll be helping with the logistics for the webinar today along with my colleague Jessica Otto. So before we go ahead and get started and get to the content for today's webinar, we're going to go through just a few logistical items with everyone to make sure you're all set. The webinar today will be an hour and a half. Audio for the webinar will be broadcast through your computer. So please make sure your speakers and your volume are turned on to hear the webinar presentation. And if you have any technical issues, problems seeing something or hearing something, you can send us a message in the Q&A pod that's located on your screen or call the number that um, is appearing on the slide. It's 1-866-916-4672 uh, and we'll be sure to assist you. So again, please make sure your computer speakers are on to hear the presentation. After the presentations today, we'll have an online Q&A session. We encourage you to type in any questions that you think of at any time while the presenters are presenting by typing them in the Q&A pod that's located on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen and clicking Enter. We will collect submitted questions and then address those during the Q&A session at the end as time permits. And if your question is for a specific presenter, we'd ask you to please reference that when typing it in if possible. Throughout the webinar, presenters may reference materials or links relevant to their presentation. You can browse web links by clicking on any of the links in the web links pod that's located on the top right hand corner of your screen and you can download materials by selecting the files in the files pod on the right hand portion of your screen. We will also be including several poll questions throughout the webinar that we encourage you to participate in. So we are very excited for the content that will be shared on today's webinar. The webinar agenda includes uh, brief introductions of our presenters, an introduction to how culture plays an important role in integrating healthy marriage and relationship education into social services, an overview of the Resource Center's free toolkit, working with American Indian and Alaska Native individuals, couples, and families, and two program examples from providers in the field who are implementing healthy marriage and relationship education into their services, keeping in mind cultural values. Following the presentations, as I mentioned, we'll have a brief online Q&A session. Um, so our presenters for the webinar today include Robin Senesal. Robin is the director for the National Resource Center for Healthy Marriage and Families. We have Terry Cross. Terry is an enrolled member of the Seneca Nation of Indians and is the founder and senior advisor of the National Indian Child Welfare Association. Terry has 41 years of experience in child welfare, including 10 years working directly with children and families. He serves as an adjunct faculty at Portland State University School of Social Work and lectures internationally on culture, racial healing, and social justice. We have Nicole Earls. Nicole is the Human Services Director for the Quileute Tribe in LaPush, Washington. She has worked for the tribe since 2005 in Head Start and TANF before accepting the director position. Prior to her work in LaPush, Nicole was a Teach for AmeriCorps member in South Texas. She has her bachelor's degree from the University of Puget Sound and her master's in guidance and counseling from City University. And last but not least, we have Elaine Topsky. Elaine is the program director for the Chippewa Cree Tribal TANF program. She has a master's degree in counseling from Montana State University Northern in Havre, Montana and is certified to teach the Cree language, culture, and history. She was born in Rocky Boy and has strong cultural ties with the Chippewa Cree tribe. She has one son, three daughters, eight grandsons, and five granddaughters. 
Um, so just a little bit about our presenters today. And now, Robin, I'm going to turn it over to you to get us started with the presentations and set the context for our discussion today. Thanks, Stephanie. I'm happy to be here today. And thank you all for joining us. The National Resource Center for Healthy Marriage and Families, our mission is connecting healthy marriage and relationship education skills and safety net service providers as part of an integrated approach to strengthening families. And the Resource Center offers an array of services and resources to support organizations who are interested in integrating relationship education skills into their programs. Outreach through conferences, Twitter, and our monthly newsletter. So be sure to follow us on Twitter. you see our hashtag down at the bottom. We also offer stakeholder-specific products, which the toolkit that you're going to hear about today is one of such product. And we have a number of other culturally specific products as well as some other topically specific products. So I hope that you'll visit the website and check some of those out. Uh, we also offer training and technical assistance. We have offered integration institutes at the state level in 22 states so far and provide ongoing technical assistance to stakeholders who are interested in integrating relationship skills into their programming. Our robust website includes a library that has over 1,000 research-based resources. Um, we are constantly adding new resources every month. And those resources are everything from research to practice briefs, to curricula, to tools such as the toolkit, and fact sheets, tip sheets, things that can be used by service providers, as well as things that can be simply printed off and shared with individuals that service providers are serving. Uh, we also have a virtual training center, and currently it has six courses in it. Uh, these courses, when completed, if you pass the final little exam at the end with 80% completion rate, uh, you will receive a certificate of completion, and these certificates can be submitted for CEUs uh, should your organization require CEUs. So I think you'll definitely want to check that out. They're all free, and they're all research-based. We also have a media gallery with, with videos and podcasts. Some interesting podcasts that are out there, one on family violence prevention. We also have one on uh, working with African American individuals. So lots of interesting stuff out there. And the videos um, are very nice, brief ways to capture and share information. So feel free to share links to those videos with individuals within your organization, as well as all of the archived archived webinars are located on the Resource Center website, as will this webinar be archived and placed on that website. Um, it takes usually two to three weeks for this to happen, for the process to complete itself and it to show up there. So if you know someone who's missing today's webinar, they will have a chance to see it later. So when we talk about healthy marriage education skills, what we're really focusing on, on are four components, four core components. And they're interpersonal skills, such as communication and conflict resolution. And these are important communication skills because these are skills that are not only important within the context of family, whether you're talking about couple relationships or parent-child relationships or even extended family relationships, but these are also the skills that transfer to the workplace and can be the make or break skills when it comes to getting and maintaining employment. We also focus on critical skills like parenting and financial education because those two issues are the number one stressors to impact families across socioeconomic lines, but can be more stressful for low resource families who may not have the coping skills or the resources to address some of these concerns. The other thing about these four skills is that when you think about integrating them into programming, they can be integrated individually or collectively as part of a, a more structured curriculum. So they're easy to integrate, for example, if your organization already offers uh, parenting, you might want to add financial education, for example. And when we talk about integration, we think very holistically about all of the social services that families across the country are taking advantage of. By integrating relationship skills in a non-punitive way in locations where families are already accessing services, it increases the likelihood that families will take advantage of these skills. If you don't learn these skills in your family of origin, many times there is not a place to learn these skills. So integrating them where they're readily available and, again, in a non-punitive way so that they're strength-based and, and they support families in gaining these skills before it becomes a crisis, that's kind of what we really are trying to promote. 
Fostering cultural competency we think is extremely important when serving families. It's not enough just to be reflective of the community you're trying to serve. It's important to understand the nuances of that community. And so we have created a series of culturally competent resources through the Resource Center. It's important to think about relationship education being integrated in ways that are culturally appropriate because culture is so important. It affects how individuals and families pass on values, behaviors, and attitudes um, generationally. And it also shapes how people view the world and their relationships and influences how individuals behave within their romantic relationships. So we're going to focus today on the um, the American Indian and Alaska Native Individuals Couples and Families Toolkit. But we do have, as I mentioned, some other culturally specific resources that are available on the Resource Center website, so I hope you'll take advantage of those if you work with other populations as well. One caveat that I'd like to mention, today you're going to hear some really good ideas, um, but it's important to know that if you happen to be working in an organization that's federally funded, for example, through a Healthy Marriage or Responsible Fatherhood grant or a reentry grant, it's going to be important for you to take back any great ideas that you hear to your project officer to make sure that those ideas can be implemented as allowable activities under your current funding. Um, because if different funding structures allow for different things, we just want to make sure that you're, we're all mindful of that. So with that, I'm going to turn you over to Terry Cross, who is the lead author on our Native American Toolkit. Thank you, and I think we're going to start with a poll. Yep. So we have a quick poll question for participants on the line that we'd like you to vote on. It's a yes or no question. Do you currently work with American Indian and or Alaska Native individuals, couples, and families as part of your service provision, yes or no? Okay, great. We'll give you a couple more minutes. Okay. So it looks like most of you do, about 75%. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. Um, I want, uh, just by way of introduction, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the, um, the diversity of tribes, uh, the, the things that we're gonna, I'm going to be presenting today, uh, it's always a dilemma to try to present things uh, from an overall point of view, uh, but I, I want to um, make sure that we preface these remarks by saying tribes are diverse. There are regional cultures. Uh, tribes are also diverse because of of the uh, impact of colonialism uh, and the way that history unfolded in different locations. Um, even tribal communities are themselves diverse internally, a uh, range of uh, of assimilated versus traditional. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. And uh, people who are enrolled in tribes uh, span the racial spectrum. Um, and so uh, people may look uh, any different uh, diverse ways that could be presented. And so just want to make sure as we're um, starting this conversation, we're uh, aware of that diversity. So the purpose uh, of the toolkit uh, is to make sure that we're able to uh, educate providers and to in increase the level of collaboration. Um, one of the ways that this toolkit might be used is by uh, local tribes. If you're a, tr a, a tribal program and you're working in collaboration with other service providers, uh, the toolkit can provide the basis for uh, some training or uh, conversations, and it would be important to adapt it locally with the impact of, for example, uh, the historic information that's in it, uh, and uh, to add uh, specific information about uh, your community. So we're hoping that this opens a conversation. 
Uh, we want to maximize providers uh, that are non-native, their recruitment and retention of American Indian families, and uh, to look at the impact of the services that they provide uh, for their, their, um, the Indian population and their service area. Also, the toolkit's uh, designed to encourage the integration of healthy marriage and relationship skills into existing services, and to do that in a way that is uh, congruent with uh, with American Indian cultures, so that the services are are meaningful. Now, I'll say a little bit more about who might use the toolkit before I move on, and that uh, can be used by non-native service providers who want to use it to to learn about uh, working not only with families and individuals, but working with, with tribes as well. Uh, but it also can be used by tribal programs who want to use it as a tool to help educate partners. Um, also could be used by uh, tribes to educate their non-native staff, um, any new staff unfamiliar with the history and policy issues. So we hope it's a tool kit that, that everyone can use. Um, we the toolkit is a reference guide to better understand history and its impact on uh, service systems and the way that people seek help and to understand the social conditions, the challenges that might be there for uh, service agencies. Um, it's, uh, we hope that it's also a, a reference guide for helping understand uh, American Indian values and how they might impact uh, use of services and to increase the awareness of, of cultural identity and the the variety of cultural identity uh, as it has to do with assimilation so uh, to not uh, treat American Indians in a stereotypical fashion thinking that everybody's the same but to honor that diversity within to improve our capacity for collaboration and we're going to talk a little bit about some, the, something called the touchstones of hope uh, that describe how to work effectively in collaboration between tribes and mainstream organizations and service agencies. And uh, we'll, it, we hope that this is a guide uh, that provides some learning strategies to integrate the healthy marriage and relationship skills into our service delivery. There are several topics that are covered in the toolkit. And the rest of our presentation, we're going to go into each one of these. You see the seven areas, the historical background, the impact of that history today. It's, uh, it is not just an interesting history or challenging history, but it has implications every day in the work that we do. And um, so to understand um, that history in today's context, uh, this second section takes a look at well, what does that all, what does that mean for the work that we do? Part of that history uh, has created a, a service system that's very complex. So we'll take a look at that. Um, and then um, we'll look at the cultural considerations as a, a section that examines the, the cultural issues that a provider might need to, to know something about. Um, there's a section on family issues, which uh, really uh, describes the challenges uh, that uh, fam our families face and the uh, issues in our communities. We'll take a look at that. There's a guide for engaging families, as I mentioned, uh, uh, you know, organized around the touchstones of hope. And finally, a section on integration of he healthy marriage and relationship education. The historical background chapter is organized um, on significant historical eras to in, inform the user, the reader, about key concepts that, that shape Indian country and the Indian experience today. And the first era is the pre-colonial uh, uh, period. Uh, and it is, of course, the time before European settlement. Um, from the time of uh, Columbus's uh, arrival, 
uh, really through the early 1600s, th there was very little contact. And this is a, a period that um, we can look at to see the cultural strengths, the, uh, the health, uh, uh, and the, uh, uh, there's strong uh, governmental uh, and social structures that were in place, clan structures, uh, and it points us to uh, things that still exist in our communities, like strong extended family networks, uh, the, uh, natural helping systems, the importance of elders, all of the things that have been with us for generations um, that we learned as ways to sustain ourselves that are still with us, and, and we still rely on, on these strengths. And the colonial period, uh, the Im importance of the development of tribal sovereignty, uh, the recognition, rather, of tribal sovereignty because tribes uh, in this colonial period, because of uh, treaty making, uh, were recognized as nations. Uh, and so in this period uh, that lasted from the early 1600s through the founding of the United States and the late 1700s, there was a power balance, a military power balance, and uh, American Indian tribes were treated as nations and written into our Constitution. Uh, treaties were written, uh, laws written about how, the, how governments could deal with tribes, and so it uh, shapes today uh, the way that, um, that tribal governments are regarded as dependent nation states within the United States, having a similar limited sovereignty as, as the states, and says a lot about tribal state relations that are covered also in the, uh, the curriculum. The period of removal and, and genocide, uh, a sh fairly short era of history uh, from the early 1800s to, uh, to about 1870. Uh, most familiar to most people is the Trail of Tears, uh, but also devastation of food supplies, disease, the loss of approximately 10 million people in about 50 years, um, tr and the tremendous impact uh, of that on uh, the historic trauma and intergenerational grief that we'll talk about in a, a few minutes. The period of assimilation, um, the official government policy of kill the Indians, save the man, the boarding school era, the, the Dawes Act, and several pieces of legislation from the late 1800s right up through the 1950s with termination, public law 280, and relocation, and of course the transracial adoption era. And ending with the self-determination and the return uh, to self and self-governance and the growth of tribal um, capacity to provide our own services and the importance now of government-to-government -government relations uh, on determining services and relationships and providing services for tribal citizens. The um, next um, uh, section is on the impact of that history, the implications of that history, um, the importance of uh, the historic distrust, and well, the relationships between tribal communities and the non-native communities, the reluctance to become involved uh, across cultures in many situations because of unresolved trauma. Um, the issues, uh, we covered the, the Dawes Act, also known as the Allotment Act, and, and its impact on membership in tribes, and the creation of identity um, issues. Um, never before the Dawes Act did tribes have blood quantum requirements, and uh, this is a federal law that, that really established that um, blood quantum um, issue. The impact of identity uh, on uh, federal policies and the history, it, um, the assimilation process, the uh, historic uh, and intergenerational trauma and, and grief. Um, there's some examples uh, shared about uh, families and how trauma can be 
um, transferred from uh, generation to generation. Um, we looked at um, family relationships and the impact on those where Indian people live the, and the diversity and complexity of the service network based on that history. The next section does deal with that complex service um, network. Um, it is, uh, looks at uh, what safety net providers need to keep in mind, um, the, the role of tribal courts, particularly around child support and child custody and uh, divorce and child welfare, other civil matters, and working with Indian families. Uh, they, they need to communicate and coordinate with tribal programs and the complexity of, those, of that service delivery system. Next, um, this consideration is the cultural considerations. And first of all, again, again, back to the issue of diversity, the importance of understanding that as Indian people, we exist on a uh, continuum all the way from very, very traditional speaking our own, uh, indigenous language and practicing traditional beliefs, all the way to people who are very, very assimilated, who have not had the opportunity to um, learn their culture, to know much about their culture, sometimes raised outside of the culture uh, in foster care or in adoption, and every conceivable combination in between. Um, the next chapter is on the family issues, the, uh, the, the history that I've talked about, the devastation of male roles, the impact of boarding schools on parenting, uh, the uh, impact of, of uh, historic trauma and family violence and, and child maltreatment. A lot of data is provided and description. Uh, we take a look at the, the incident of, of poverty and the impact of poverty, um, also substance misuse, the untreated trauma. Uh, but we don't just look at the doom and gloom, or just this section also includes a, a look at the resiliency factors, uh, how we've been able to survive through against tremendous odds and, and the importance of cultural identity um, and um, reliance on those uh, indigenous ways of helping uh, of our family structures, uh, of our practices of staying healthy, and, uh, and the importance of our kinship structures and the family strengths that we maintain despite these very difficult historic issues. The next section is on engaging American Indian Alaska Native families and services. Uh, you, and it, we outline the touchstones of hope um, as guiding values, the touchstones of hope were developed in 2005 at an international convening of indigenous and mainstream leaders who identified a key set of values that should, un that should underlie any service delivery to uh, indigenous families, not only here in the United States, but across the world. Um, there are several uh, values that uh, un, uh, the underpinning of this of the touchstones, uh, self determination, that we are in the that uh, indigenous people are in the best position to know what's good for them, um, and making sure that as we're approaching um, the work uh, that is collaborative, that American Indian people are in charge of their own lives, that. Culture is a resource, and language is an important aspect of that culture, so that the service provision has to enhance culture and language as a function of helping people, that the approaches should be holistic, uh, supporting the whole person, that structural interventions, in other words, dealing with issues of poverty and housing and uh, substance misuse and mental health all, all have to be addressed in an environment which uh, is non-discriminatory. In other words, um, access to service uh, and um, equity is an important issue in delivering those services. 
Um, finally, they have a section on uh, uh, integration of healthy relationship. And we base this um, section on some uh, research that was conducted by NICWA and the uh, Native Wellness Institute, uh, looking at Native couples across the country and asking what is a healthy Native relationship. Um, and just a few items we sorted around the four quadrant circle we call the relational worldview model of mind, body, spirit, and context. And just one example from each of those areas, or a couple examples. Um, so in the, the mind quadrant, um, a healthy Native couple has uh, good communication skills, uses humor, and, uh, and finds joy in their relationship, and having skills at caring for one another. Uh, in the physical, um, the body quadrant, a holistic intimacy, um, an intimacy that comes with supporting one, one another and um, in having a, a relationship that is uh, based in, in joy and um, mutual caring. The positive um, shared values and practices in that spirit quadrant and finally in that um, uh, context or quadrant, uh, environment quadrant, being of service to one another in community. And this was unique um, across all of the, the literature we reviewed about healthy relationships. Several of these items were, were not included in what the, um, what the mainstream defines as, um, as a healthy relationship. So there are some specific cultural values with regard to healthy relationships that are important for us to, uh, to maintain. And finally, uh, as we look at integration of the healthy marriage and relationship education to the safety net, um, we're, there's uh, material on in the important relationship skills, the benefits for children and youth, um, community be benefits, and, and the reduced family stress. These are, this is uh, the, our um, summation of each of the, the sections. Uh, we're, we hope that the toolkit can be used uh, to help with planning and reaching out to partners for a, uh, as a catalyst for uh, dialogue and discussion. And, so that there's the importance of engaging uh, tribes can't be underestimated. The, the, the most uh, important aspect of, of working and serving tribal communities is to work collaboratively with tribal governments and, and Indian nonprofits um, to make sure that, com that services are community-based whenever possible. Uh, and this, we hope the toolkit will inform social marketing and outreach and, and inform the service designs of safety net agency. Uh, we provide examples of how uh, services can be co-located uh, so that they're most effective. And there's a section on communication tips on how to um, deal with some of the cross-cultural communication uh, mismatches uh, that can occur because of different worldviews or, or uh, different cultural languages. So I'm going to hand it off now to Nicole um, for a discussion on, from her community. Thank you, Terry. So I'm, I think, going to click the next slide. There we are. Um, so I am Nicole Earls. I'm the Human Services Director of the Quileute Tribe, and we are in La Push in Washington, um, right on the ocean on the peninsula. This uh, talk is about uh, how our youth and family programs and how um, we're currently applying the toolkit and how moving forward we hope to do this more in our community. And we have a poll question. Okay. I will go ahead and pull up that poll question. Okay, 
So this question is, if you work in an area that serves tribal members, do you serve multiple tribes? Yes or no? I'll give everyone a couple more seconds, but it looks like the majority of people are saying yes. So over 80%, or I guess we're down to about 78% say yes, they serve multiple tribes. Okay, thank you. Okay. So I, I started out with posting our mission, our vision statement that our Department of Human Services currently has. And some of it, this was good for me in practice after going through the toolkit to look at our mission and vision that was, it was developed in 2008. Uh, our department, you know, had work days and we, we really spent a lot of time talking about this. Uh, but over the years, our department has changed a lot. We've added new programs and new services. And these statements now, we've said some of kind of those catchphrases, culturally sensitive, um, we want to enhance, you know, the lives of our fam individuals and families and the integrity of our relationships. But some of it that we said we didn't really understand, I think, back then what we needed to do. And the ways that we have changed in our department over the years and in our partnerships really has us looking at this and, and thinking that this might be the time for us to revisit our mission and vision statement and update things and, and make sure that this is really how we're doing, providing services and how we want uh, the community to see us, see our mission and our vision. Um, so this was just kind of, it was a good practice for me to look at this and to think uh, just internally how are we doing and could we do better. And I also included the vision of our youth and family program. We are the TNF ICW uh, collaboration grantees. We're in our ninth year. And at some point towards the end of our first five-year grant, we developed the vision, um, our vision of a low teen pregnancy rate where our youth um, have good decision-making skills and are actively engaged in their culture, their educational success, and career planning. And we wanted to develop um, a community with a high capacity for effective parenting where we could um, kind of help end some of those destructive multi-generational cycles that as we, as from Terry's presentation and historically looking at tribal communities, have really been a challenge in helping families um, find that cohesiveness again and, and learn how to parent. and. And um, we, as the service providers, need to know how to support that and how to develop and provide services that allow for creating parent-child relationships that are strong and um, really look at our services and make sure that we aren't contributing to more destruction in the family. Um, because I think sometimes we get caught up and we accidentally do that. And we want to make sure that we are, we are just as aware and that we are doing the best um, and the, this vision was kind of the impetus for us to really start focusing on providing healthy relationship education and in all different areas as, as often as possible. And so I have, um, you know, the program goals of the youth and family program aren't, weren't just about um, healthy relationship education, but I think in a way it, we kind of we fell back on that and, uh, you know, we really wanted to, when we first started, we were looking at we want kids to graduate, we want um, families to not have repeat removals in ICW, and, and but we're, what it all really comes back down to, it, it is that healthy relationship and giving kids the tools and the understanding um, to really enter into their own healthy relationships, helping the parents develop healthy relationships with their children help the family to become a healthier family unit. And so um, even with these goals, we kind of realized that, that everything we were doing was around healthy relationship education. And so one of the activities that we provide every month and that was so popular for a while, we were doing them twice a month, is our mom's lunches. 
Um, so we've combined its funds through our youth and family program and our TNF, and we hold hour-long lunch events for local moms, and then we had some dads who were raising their younger kids, you know, single dads, and they said, well, why can't we attend? And, you know, we said, of course you can. We shouldn't really call this mom's lunch. It's kind of the name has stuck, but we welcome anyone who's parenting um, a child from birth to five. The speak, we have a speaker who comes and presents on a topic um, to offer information. There's a lot of good discussion that goes on at these mom's lunches. It's really more of a learning environment. We're not there to hand out this is how, this is how it is, this is how you have to parent. It really is about this is a learning experience for all of us. None of us exactly do the right thing, but here are some tools, here are people you can talk to, and here's a safe place to come and, and ask questions. Um, we provide a healthy lunch, and we get a gift package for everyone, and that I think that was the biggest um, factor in getting really good attendance, but we've got moms that have really good memories of their mom's lunches when they were first starting out. We also offer family fun night. So once a month we hold a dinner and provide activities for all families in the community. The community of La Push is actually um, really small. Our tribal enrollment is <clears throat> just around 700, um, but in the community there's three or 400. And we've had family nights where we've had 80 people there, and that's, that's huge for the community. Um, so we're really proud of that, and we're really happy about that attendance. Families get information and prizes, and the real goal is just to show families how important it is to sit down and eat together, to communicate with one another, and it's been a really hard um, event for us to actually figure out how effective we are being, but if we look at attendance and just the community satisfaction, we know that we're, we're doing a good thing, and we really hope that every month people go home with a new skill or uh, some knowledge. We also, uh, in a different um, program, our New Beginnings Domestic Violence Program, there's a grant for an elder and youth healthy relationship building, and so it's a collaboration between the New Beginnings and the clinic, which is overseeing that program, and our senior center, and we have a, a coordinator at the senior center who working on cultural and craft projects every week. The goal is just to have fun conversation and create an atmosphere of creativity and wellness. It's very well attended. We really want um, them to be inviting their family members. We are really hoping that more teens will be able to attend in the summer. Um, now that school's out, just to have healthy conversation about healthy relationships and some of the cultural practices and really give the, the elders an opportunity to teach the youth um, more about their culture. And we also have during the school year, uh, the youth come up from the, one of the classes in the tribal school and participate in a bingo game with the elders. And they love it. Like that's one of our lunches where most, we have more elders who choose to come and eat and play bingo with the kids and just um, really, it really is a very positive atmosphere. They're just having fun and building those relationships. And it, these are combinations of coordination between a lot of different programs. And this isn't, um, these success factors might not be relevant for every community, but for our community we found, you know, the biggest indicator of our success is that participants are having positive interactions. Um, we want to make sure we have good curriculum, we want to make sure there's someone who can really facilitate and keep the topics relevant, and that our speakers are really good, but overall, we found in our surveys that when people attended an event and it was, there were those positive interactions and they were learning more about healthy relationships and communication, they were more satisfied when they left than if um, the event was missing something in that. And a lot of the work that we do is really centered around our partnerships. And for our community in Quileute, we are very lucky that we all uh, actively work together and collaborate. That's something that is kind of, has kind of been 
handed down from our leadership, but also I've got amazing staff. I have got people who are willing to just get out there and do what needs to be done and work together. And um, you know, our this is a list of all of the programs at the tribe that work together in one way or another. Um, and then in the town of Forks, which is about 20 minutes away, um, a lot of the school district works with us. The Forks Abuse Program uh, works with us. We attend the Readiness to Learn Consortium, which is a group of service providers in the area who get together and just talk about how can we help kids and families, what services do we have available. And um, it's, I am blessed to work in a community that, that has that um, real push for partnerships. And I know it's not always the same. I have visited other communities where a lot of these programs, the TANF program, and the abuse program and the child welfare program are very siloed and they work very separately from one another. And we have found that the best way to reach families and the best way to get that healthy relationship education out there is to break down those silos and really focus on working together. Um, we've been very lucky that we haven't, um, we don't even have to document it anymore. We do the documentation to have the paperwork, but we went out originally and we're creating these you know, very detailed MOUs and letters of agreement and, and now we just, we automatically fall into that, um, that we're gonna work together and we call each other up and we work together. Um, one of the things that I wanted to really stress about how the toolkit fits into tribal programming, um, we, you know, we serve all um, federally recognized tribal members in a lot of our um, services and programs that we provide. And I originally opened this toolkit and thought, you know, I don't know, we, we, it's, maybe this is for service providers who aren't on a tribal reservation or for someone who doesn't work with that many tribal members. But really it was a good wake up call for me and a good reminder. Um, you know, we are not all the same, that just kept um, going through my mind when I was looking at this toolkit and developing this PowerPoint um, and to go back to what Terry's mention of diversity. We're a Quileute program but we serve a lot of different tribal members. Um, we're not all the same even though we're a Quileute program. The culture among every family and individual varies. That glossary in this toolkit is a great reference for us. Um, we really do run that range just in our small community of traditional to assimilated. And knowing that when developing our programs that every person and every family is gonna have a slightly different need and a slightly different take is important. Um, <clears throat> we're not all the same and we as tribal workers have the responsibility to actively educate and advocate among all of our partners. Um, that makes our jobs even more complex, I think, sometimes when I go to a local meeting or a state meeting or a federal meeting and I'm having to remind them, you know, this is how it is at Quileute, but that's not how it is at the neighboring tribe. So you have to talk to them. Talking to me doesn't count, you know, and, and, and again, saying I'm just a tribal worker, I'm a director, but I'm not a tribal member. So you have to talk to the council. You need to get, their blessing in some of these decisions. And so really advocating um, and developing that relationship. And uh, you know, as from my perspective, uh, Washington State has been a great state to work with for the most part, but we're always pushing that you, we can get better. You know, we can always get better. Um, you know, we're not all the same and we really have to check ourselves constantly. Um, I have different values and expectations than um, someone I grew up with in the community and I have to remember to not place my values on them. Are we minimizing their experiences? So asking ourselves those questions um, is always valuable no matter where we work. And then just um, moving forward, the future steps that we plan to take, we do plan to update our mission and vision statement. We, we need to get back into improving how we document our partnerships. Um, and just as a side note, this past year I've had um, a lot of reminders about really focusing on the children and the families and doing what's best for them. When leadership changes or a program director changes, sometimes there's tension and we have to kind of 
say, hey, this is how we all work together. And even when we don't agree and we have different philosophies, the, the unwritten statement in our department is we always work together for the good of the families and the community, um, even when we don't agree. And we've had a good time to put that in practice this last year. Um, but we're going to continue to train. We're going to look at developing training sessions that align with this toolkit. We always want to be more responsive. We always want to make sure we're incorporating the culture in our programming to the best of our ability and that we continue to grow and, um, and improve. And so this, you know, this toolkit came out at a good time for us. We're in another growth stage in our department. And I, um, I appreciate everyone being here to uh, listen to this. If you ever have any questions, feel free to contact me. Um, I think now I'm handing it over to Elaine. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Elaine Topsky, and I work with the Chippewa Cree Tribal TANF program. That's temporary assistance to Native families. And I've been there since 2004 when the program started. In, on the slide, you'll see where we're located at. This is a map of Montana. And you'll see that um, there are these reservations in Montana, and we're the smallest. So you, can, you can barely see us on the map. We're like 40 miles from the Canadian border. So we, we have relatives, and we go back and forth from Canada to Montana. Um, so that's, that's where we are. The intent of the um, TANF program is to provide services to those families that are, are eligible. And, and it's, um, there's a lot of paperwork involved. Um, some, of the, uh, some of the barriers that we have for, for our clients are they come to us with they may be high school dropouts, and that's one of the main barriers, and yet another main barrier is the driver's license. There are many young people that do not have driver's license, and and we have um, the population. The population in in Montana are in Rocky Boy. Um, we we have we have about 3,300 over 3,000 enrolled members that live in Rocky Boy. And about a quarter of that population are 25 years and, young, and younger. So we have a very young population. So our, um, the work that we do in the teen pregnancy prevention and education is big. It's, it's, it's a big part of our program. And we promote two-parent family activities as much as we can, like at the family nights. Um, we had Father's Day activities, uh, but we have we have many activities, and in everything that we do, we include culture. All of these um, all of these areas, we include will include um, speakers that come in and look at our history and who we are as Chippewa Cree people. The main focus of TANF is to guide people towards self-sufficiency. And one of, um, one of the tools that, that we use in our, in our programs is um, the Nehi Ojibwe Positive Parenting Program. And this is a, a parenting program that we developed and we used the National Indian Child Welfare Association, NICWA, um, parenting program model. And we, we had a group of people that just met regularly and we, um, we, we put in our values in the model and, and we use it in our parenting program now. It's, um, it's, a very, it's a very good model and for anybody that um, can refer to it, we have our, our values um, on paper because a lot of times we have oral tradition and there are many people who do, 
who don't who do not have access to someone to tell them about when a baby is born, you know, the meaning of the child. So we have we have it all detailed out in the lessons in our parenting program. So in our parenting program, uh, we hold once a week. We we have those lessons from one to eight, and we cover we cover those. Um, we have meals, um, door prizes, and elder speakers come in to reinforce part of that um, the lesson that's being talked about. The first one is traditional parenting. What is it about? What is traditional parenting? We can't live in the past. But we want to know where we came from. We're um, we're a pretty new reservation in Rocky Boy. The people that were did not have a home, that did not agree to the treaties in the 1800s, um, came together. The Cree and the Chippewa, they came together and they were they were they formed and they um, Congress Congress by executive action. Uh, provided a home for these people because they were there were two bands of of Indians that did not have a home. So um, the Chippewa came from the Great Lakes area, and the Cree uh, were in, around the Plains area. So that's how Rocky Boy came to be. And so when we have these parenting sessions, we talk about those values, and like the other speakers said, you were we're we're a very diverse uh, people. We cannot say, well, this is my way. This is how, how you should take care of your child. We cannot say that. We can offer the tools um, by using the toolkit or using this parenting curriculum that we have. This is the meaning of the child. This is the meaning of the, the moss bag. This is, a, this is a moss bag that we we have to wrap the baby in, and there are others, that, other tribes that use the cradle board, but there's a meaning in um, why we wrap the babies up. And so that is explained to the young parents. And um, one of the, I can mention that when we had an active parent, teen parenting program, there were young people that walked to, the, to class because because of the support that was offered there and some of the few items that will, would help them just to be there, like um, a box of uh, wash soap, you know, something like that, that that could help them in their daily life. And also an elder that would talk to them and talk to them about what it means to be a parent, what it means to be a woman or a man and what they can do to to be in that role. So the, um, the teachings are powerful um, in how to, how to take care of their baby and take care of their baby together. Um, that was the traditional parenting part. And some of, the, some of the areas that the people are very hungry about is people want to have an Indian name but they're not exactly sure what that means and how to go how to go about the protocol in doing that. And this is where people help them. Right now we have um, we're helping people um, we're helping people with the initiation into the dance arena. There's also um, passage rights to that and the meaning of why people do that. So we, we had a person come in and talk to the parents about the meaning of that. And then we have, um, we have classes right now to help parents make those dance clothes. And, and if they're interested, then when we get to the powwow in August, there's a children's day where, where they have the time, the time set aside for the parents and the children if they want to, if they want to go through that um, passage right. So I think now we, we have a poll question. And we get question. to the poll question. We will go ahead and put that up for everybody. Okay. Hey, 
and the question is, in Montana, approximately how many grandparents are raising their grandchildren without parental involvement? That's, um, that's over 6,000. Okay, so we'll go ahead and hide that question. Okay, Elaine, you can go ahead. Okay, um, we we have um, we have state meetings with our grandparents, raising grandchildren, um, and we. The GRG has a regular newsletter out for those branches of GRG um, groups that we have. And we have one in Rocky Boys under the, uh, the college system, under the extension department. We have, um, we have a, an active GRG uh, group in Rocky Boy. And uh, for, for our TANF program, we fluctuate about 150 cases a month. And a quarter of those cases are grandparents raising grandchildren cases, caregiver cases. And a lot of times, um, most of the time, I would say the grandparents are taking care of the grandchildren, not by choice, but because they have to. And there are reasons the, pa the parents could be incarcerated. Uh, social services may have been involved. Um, there could be ill illness or death even, but um, it's, um, it's a role that grandparents have taken on and we're, um, they're valuable. They're valuable in being able to take care of their children and uh, some of the, some of the um, support that we give the, the grandparents and the caregivers are, you know, they, um, we can't solve their problems, but we can only we can only offer support and sometimes and that's through meetings and knowing that we're not we're not alone. Uh, some of the some of the areas though that the grandparents help their children is is um, promoting that spirituality that we all need and offering. Um, learning of the, the language, talking to the children about language and about life, respect in many ways and uh, the knowledge of, of life and also to never give up. No matter where the child is that we're taking care of, and it's me too, I take care of my grandchildren, um, to let them know to never give up. And so those are those are the core values that we that we that we hold tight to. In our tribal tennis program, um, guiding our people to self-sufficiency is, is one of the most important areas. And the way we do that is through the work readiness program and through job preparation and uh, those other supportive skills, job skills, um, teaching the people how to to cook even and how to take care of a house if they're if they're not really knowledgeable about about how to go about doing minor repairs uh, what to look for in the home like changing the filters we have a partnership with um, all of our all of our departments in in Rocky Boy and one of them is housing so they'll come in and they'll help the clients with weatherization and and give out material for um, how to weatherize the doors and windows. And so, and so some of them may have, some of the clients may have an aptitude in that area and, and could do, do small repairs and, and they could uh, well offer them job opportunities and have um, programs to go out and, and do weatherization for the, for the elders. Some of, the, some of the areas that we have is we have, um, we're very lucky in that we have the education starting from early, um, early daycare to all the way to post-secondary post, um, education. 
and they're all um, headed by tribal members. Our, our Rocky Boy school superintendent is a tribal member, and that was K-12, to and our um, college is, is a tribal member. And those boards are also filled by tribal members. So, so those are those are the peop the key people in our in our communities, and, and we work well well with our in our partnerships with them. One of the one of the uh, programs that we work with and that we uh, we help develop is is a program that you could find on on the internet. It's working it out. It's it's um it's a soft skills program that helps people with um, conflict in the workplace, personal um, personal beliefs, uh, and and I have that that um, internet address there. But we have we developed that to fit our our people, and it's called working with tradition. And so while we're we did that. We included um, scenarios with our people, with Native people, and, and and it's really cool. You know, we we have home versus work beliefs. You know, some of those some of those ideas that we have, we don't um, we don't really know. Um, Thoughts, feelings, and physical changes, and. Um, being in survival mode, sometimes we just come out fighting. If someone tells us, um, tells us, maybe gives us a direction, but because as Indian people, we may not be used to taking direction. So that's that's um, that's covered in the Working with Tradition handbook and Indian Native American. Um, Figures are included in the workbook, and it's it's really it's really nice. People people like it. Some of the goals that we have in there is building self-esteem by uh, reinforcing who we are as Indian people. In Rocky Boy, um, we we're isolated. We're 30 miles from the nearest town. Um, and so that that could be a key factor in having our culture and our language intact, but it also could be um, a way that has hurt us because we have um, we have the media that has um, has negative has had a negative impact on our on our young people and. Maybe sometimes the young people have a have a concern that sometimes the young people may have they live in this dimension and the computer and on on the internet or on Facebook the young people are going to all these programs and so they're constantly looking at their their gadgets and to a point where you try to have dinner with somebody and they're they're looking at their their uh, their phone instead of talking to you. So we um, we talk a lot about that, and um, we have to address it in our own families of how we can put those away so we can talk more to each other because communication is so important in our our beliefs and who we are. So those are the things that we we work on strengthening and to improve the organization skills, communication skills, and how to how people can address life in their in their daily daily lives. Uh, a sample lesson I have here is uh, it's harder when we don't know we don't know where to start and that's a, that's a personal goal. Goal setting begins by thinking big. And some of those some of those ways are pretty hard because of um, where we may come from from our from our home environment, some of those things um, may not have been a goal in in some of our families and so so those uh, personal goals we we cover with with our young people and we'll have another big opportunity for that in our summer youth employment program 
where we, we will have uh, people coming in and talking to the young people about uh, some of those values and how to separate the personal family, the cultural values, and uh, work at the work readiness, the life skills, and, and thinking about a career for themselves, um, a realistic career, and, and not something like, I want to be an NBA player, because not everybody can, can has that kind of a skill or talent. And um, drugs and alcohol are are a huge concern in our in our community, and uh, the denial that's going on, um, the lack of trust, and knowing sometimes not knowing not knowing um, what's real because of the home environment again. So, so the other answers that we we will talk we talk to our families about is um, that meaning of integrity. Um, honesty and respect and um, loving one another, praying and and um, the Chippewa Cree people are known for their hospitality. If people have come to Rocky Boy, uh, especially during the powwow, um, we're known for for being very hospitable. If you come to us, and we like to feed people, um, so we have. Um, we have a lot of giveaways because there's a, a, a very high meaning, meaning in, in what we do. So, and that's why um, there's so much of it during our powwows and in other ways too throughout the year and uh, giving things away and helping each other. But so, like I say, the, the media and some of, some of the breakdown in our families are um, kind of getting lost in that. So. The last time we had the the grandparents raising grandchildren meeting, we had uh, we talked a lot about that, and some of the young people not really communicating what our cultural values are, what they mean to us in a contemporary setting, and so the young people are not hearing that. So, uh, and that was a concern that we talked about there, and. Um, the people are willing to share what they know, and one of mo one of the most important um, areas is the people wanting to donate their time during the uh, during the summer youth employment program, which part half a day will be filled with cultural activities, and the other half will be um, the life skills and the educational part of it. But um, some of those. Some of those areas we, we tell the young people is, this is how you can be useful. This is what you can do. You can clean your yard. You can, um, you can make simple repairs and clean your house. Get involved in the community. If you go somewhere, if, if you don't know how to go to a sweat because some people don't know how to go in that door if they want to get involved, well, find a friend and go to that ceremony so they can join their family, so they can um, have an idea of, of what goes on in the ceremony. One of the, there was um, a couple at, the, at GRG that said that they would donate their time at our summer youth employment program. They said they would set up their teepee and they have furnishings inside. They have the backrest and the buffalo robe and they're going to set that up and talk to the young people about the boys' roles, the girls' roles, and um, what it means to be to be married and, and those kind of roles. Um, they have pipes, that they're, but they're willing to share all their teachings that we have. So I'm going to take them up on it. I'm going to, I'm, I'm partnering with Rocky Boy School and they're, and they're letting us use the facilities there for our, for our, um, youth and we're planning on having 100 youth. Some of the summer activities we have that, that we've found have been successful is a driver's license boot camp. We offer that um, and it's open to the community. We have like a $500 uh, incentive. It's in gift certificate form, but, but there are so many people driving without a driver's license. And the same thing with the high set. That's the old GED program. We'll have a boot camp there too. Uh, we've had really good success in those two boot camps. 
and then we'll have the Summer Youth Employment Program. We plan um, a subsidized employment program. It will be only for five people, but those five, pe five people were the ones, will be the ones who are work ready from our department. And one time we're going to have an in intensive driver's license class. These are TANF clients only that have, um, do not have a driver's license and have fines. So we are going to do that. Our swim trip, we have, we've had up to five buses. The only requirement is that the parents or guardians go with their children, and it, it's, it's huge. Uh, I've talked about the girls' groups, the boys' groups, and the, and the dance regalia making. Uh, we have, um, there's a special um, project there. They call it the medicine dance, and that's the jingle dress. So there's, um, and we're going to offer that um, at the Pow Wow to special time for, for the medicine dress and explain the meaning of that. And that's the end of my, my, my part. Great. Thanks, Elaine. So now you will see uh, the slide popping up on just a reminder on how to ask a question. So. Uh, you can type those in in the Q&A pod that's located on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen and then by clicking enter. So we'll wait just a few moments to give participants time to go ahead and submit your questions. So if you do have a question, feel free to, to go ahead and submit that now for any of our presenters. Okay, we have one question that's come in. Um, I think any of our presenters could, could answer this, but maybe we'll start with Terry. The question is, historical trauma has been mentioned several times as a cr critical cultural consideration for working with this population. Do you feel that demonstrating respect for this is the most important factor for establishing a rapport with NAIA individuals and families? Well, certainly uh, to make sure that your uh, services are, are trauma-informed, uh, in other words, understanding the impact of, of trauma, uh, it may uh, be a, a matter of acknowledging it, but certainly understanding behaviors that you might see as a, um, as a manifestation of that historic trauma. And in the, the toolkit, we use an example, um, a... A grandmother uh, who was abused in boarding school, uh, who come, you know, who comes home, uh, and has uh, you know, hypersensitivity to to criticism, to uh, and has uh, developed uh, a set of protective behaviors that then uh, she shelters her children uh, communicating that fear to the next generation uh, and so that the next generation developing a set of behaviors and interacting with the world that are based in, in the mother's fear and trauma um, that then uh, keep them from engaging in, um, in healthy uh, relationship practices. So, it's, so just understanding what that, um, how uh, historic trauma is with us still today in an intergenerational pattern um, is important in that service delivery. Okay, thank you, Terry. Uh, we have another question that I think uh, would be either for Elaine or for Nicole. Um, the question is, are any of these programs also considering or integrating traditional roles of extended family members in the child rearing? Um, this is Nicole. So uh, absolutely, we, in fact, we don't even speak to it because we're so used to it, but in all of our programming, we have a way to um, address that. Uh, we have a lot of extended family members, grandparents raising grandchildren, um, aunties with their nieces and nephews, and so everything we do, we just, we offer it as family, and we don't 
we don't add a little side note that you know extended relatives are welcome to. Um, we just kind of we we treat it as this is just as this is the same to us as um, if you were the the typical you know two parent household. Um, so that's kind of how we do that. Um, I hope that helps. Uh, this is Elaine. We have um, we have our kinship and relationship that's very strong in our community, and the young people have gotten away from it on what the meaning is of the uncle having the responsibility and being able to discipline um, nieces and nephews. But we ha we have a we a chart was developed in by a language program, and so viewing that chart and going over the kinship and the relationship and how and how that how that set up in a family um, is is very helpful to people and the other thing is being able to address each other uh, in a relationship home uh, way like auntie in in our language that carries more respect or even their sister and their brother because those um those carry such in-depth meaning in our tribe when you talk about your brother, the respect you have of your brother. So covering that kinship and those words helps develop that meaning of how, how everything is tied together, everything is related in, the, in our Indian way, you know, the air and everything. Uh, so that can be a huge huge lesson and you can only do a little bit of it but doing having that kinship chart uh, really works okay thanks Elaine um, Nicole a question for you um, since you've started implementing aspects of the toolkit have you seen any positive outcomes or changes such as reduction in domestic violence or teen pregnancies or better parenting skills um, and if so, could you talk a little bit um, about what you've seen? Okay, I'll say that since the toolkit's new, we we haven't really started implementing things in relation to that. But in the last nine years of our youth and family programming and those the groups that we do with the teens and the high schools, the moms' lunches and the family fun nights, we have seen a an increased graduation rate in our teens. Um, especially those that are attending the school in Forks. Um, we have seen a decreased teen pregnancy rate. I wouldn't say that we're down 100%, but we, are, we have definitely seen a reduction. And uh, we, are better than the, we are better than the national average in those in that dropout and that teen pregnancy rate and before we were worse. Uh, and that's a nine year that's nine years of work. Um, we have also seen a reduction just in the past two years because I've got some really active, um, very, very good ICW caseworkers now. We have seen a reduction in the number of removals because we've started to implement family preservation services. I've got a great FPS worker, I've got a great TANF worker, and we're um, we're seeing more services to keep families together, and and so the reductions have gone down. And that's we've had zero removals in this last year, and that speaks volumes compared to historically what was happening. We're also being able to reunify and giving our kids um, more services and in, in independent living and things like that. So we have seen some really great things. We definitely have we still have room for improvement and that's kind of what we keep saying is there's ways that we can we can do more we'd love to do more with our with our elders and really start um, get that youth relationship with the elders more robust and learn more you know like Elaine was mentioning the family relationships what is it what is that for our community I don't know and and I really want to to learn so um, I hope that answers the question Definitely does. Thank you, Nicole. So I think in the interest of time, we will go ahead and wrap up. But I just wanted to remind everyone that they can download the toolkit that we've been referencing throughout the webinar on the files pod that's located on the right-hand portion of your screen. Just click on it, and then you can download that so you have that 
in your files for reference. So, I think that is it for today. So I just wanted to thank you all so much to the presenters for your expertise and willingness to share with us today. Um, as the webinar concludes, there will be a brief survey that pops up on your screen. So please remember to provide your feedback using the survey as it will help us in planning future webinars. You should see that pop up right now. Um, and if you have any additional questions, you can send them to info at healthymarriageandfamilies.org. And to check out more of our resources and information, you can go to our website, which is www.healthymarriageandfamilies.org. So thanks again. Um, Robin, do you have any final closing comments? Yeah, I'd like to just say thanks again to Terry, Nicole, and Elaine. It's always great to have you guys join us. Um, you're all doing great work, and we so appreciate the work that you're doing on the ground, and um, we're happy as a resource center to support that work in any way we can. Also, to those who attended today, thank you so much again for joining us. I, I know we're all busy, so I appreciate you taking the time out. And a re reminder that you heard a lot of great ideas of things that are happening, both by Nicole and Elaine. Just be sure that if you're federally funded, if you do receive grant dollars to fund your program, to be sure that you are checking with your uh, federal program specialist to make sure that whatever new ideas you hear are allowable activities under the funding that you receive. And with that, I will uh, bid you all adieu and thanks again. That does conclude today's conference. Thank you for your participation.